If you woke up from a 30-year coma, the first thing you'd be asking is, why the heck are house prices so high? How did we go from a situation where a single income family could easily afford a house and pay it off to the current situation where a double income family has to save for 10 years just to get a deposit and then have a massive mortgage that they'll probably have to pay off for the next 30 or even more years? I'm Biko Konstantinos and that's what we're gonna talk about today. If you like this video, like this video, and please consider subscribing to my channel. I genuinely want to get to know you and learn from you. So how have we screwed affordability this bad? Am I saying that house prices shouldn't go up? Definitely not. Everything goes up in price and that's called inflation. That's the reason why our wages go up. So in a perfect world where housing stays affordable, house prices would rise around about the same as wages would rise, which would be around about the same as inflation. But that definitely hasn't happened in Australia. Check out this chart here. We've got property prices in orange, wages in grey, and inflation in this teal colour. Throughout the 1990s, house prices, wages and inflation were rising around about the same level. But then in the late 1990s, early 2000s, property prices started to massively outperform both wages and inflation. And in the last couple of years, the gaps become more like a chasm. This, my friend, is why we have a housing affordability crisis. It's why Australians are obsessed with property, because the growth basically outstrips anything else. This is why Australians will basically borrow as much as they can to buy as much property as they can. It's why at every barbecue, someone will mention house prices. And it's why an Australian will always tell you the best time to buy a house is now. And this is all part of the reason why we saw such crazy fear of missing out speculation over the past couple of years. Because non-homeowners wanted a piece of this never-ending housing profit machine. Let's see how bad things have gotten by checking out this chart from McCrindle. The chart compares 1981 house prices and wages to 2021 house prices and wages. For example, in Sydney in 1981, the median house price was 78900 which represented five times the average wage. However, in early 2021, the median price was around $1.3 which represented 14.3 times the average wage. Now fast forward a short period and the median house price in Sydney is now $1.6 which would be more like 16 times the average wage. According to this chart, the 40 year increase in house prices has been 16.9 times. And we know the current figures are even higher. Now comparing house prices to wages is one of the biggest clues regarding housing affordability. Back in 1981, Melbourne houses were 2.8 times the average wage. Brisbane was 2.9, Perth 2.8, Adelaide 2.5, Canberra 2.5, and Hobart 2.3 times. That's what I call extremely affordable housing. And this continued all throughout the 1980s and 1990s. But then like the chart we saw earlier, it all got screwed up. For more evidence on just how bad things are, the latest demography report shows that Australia has five cities in the top 20 least affordable in the developed world, with Sydney ranked as the second least affordable behind Hong Kong. Now you might think the housing boom has affected all countries the same, but check out this chart from the New Daily. House prices compared to per capita income, which means the average income per person, has grown incredibly in Australia compared to the rest of the world. This is not right and it's gotten out of control. This opinion piece by Malcolm Knox of the Sydney Morning Herald likens what has happened in Australian housing as generational betrayal. The author talks about a one bedroom flat he bought in old Bondi 27 years ago for $164,000. And recently that same flat was sold for 
million. The author highlights that over that 27 year period, wages have approximately doubled, but that one bedroom flat with no parking actually went up seven times. Now let's consider some of the points from this article. The intergenerational property divide is the deepest and meanest wedge in Australian society. As it deepens further, it is changing our country in ways that we are nowhere near reckoning with. Rebounding interest rates will punish the young and others outside the golden property circle for a boom that they have not been a part of. And after getting few of the benefits, they will get all of the pain. And you can see that happening now with soaring cost of living, soaring rent prices and ridiculously expensive housing. So to paraphrase, if you or your family haven't been able to ride this property boom, you've been basically screwed. One reason for this unfairness is that property prices are almost totally excluded from the official inflation measures. The Consumer Price Index or CPI, our gauge for inflation and therefore the trigger for interest rates, is calculated from a basket of consumables. Housing comprises 23%, so you might think our CPI would actually be sky high considering all the property price rises we've seen over the years. However, that's not the case. The housing component of CPI measures rent and the price of newly built dwellings, but not what Australians pour trillions into, which is existing properties. Economists justify this by defining property as an asset, a transfer of wealth rather than consumption. However, by not including existing property prices in the CPI, it gives us inflation readings that are quite low, even if property prices are skyrocketing. And with low inflation comes low interest rates. A first way in which this punishes the young and non-homeowners is that the low interest rates we've had in response to this flat official inflation has allowed existing homeowners to borrow and buy more, driving up prices and blocking the way to those who are not already in the game. Secondly, tens of thousands of homeowners can use their mortgage redraw facility for consumption purposes. Drawing down from the mortgage is a luxury for those who are able to watch their house prices go up. And this contributes to the rising inflation that will actually punish everyone equally, whether they own a house or not. So non-homeowners get punished by soaring costs, which has been caused in part by homeowners being able to spend more because of the price of their houses rising. Once again, Non-homeowners in Australia have been royally screwed. So who benefits from inflation looking like it's actually quite low? One, politicians who can tell voters that the inflation rate is actually lower than what it really is. And two, wealthy elites who can load up on cheap debt and deploy it in the financial markets, for example, property. Which is why property owners have been able to buy more and more property and non-homeowners are finding it harder and harder to even buy one property. Intergenerational inequity becomes even more entrenched when interest rates finally have to catch up and start rising. Because only those who are able to live off their savings, e.g. retirees, will benefit from rising interest rates. And guess what? That excludes the young generation. So what does that mean for the younger generation? Screwed again. Those who have benefited from this big, undeserved Ponzi scheme the Australian housing market, now see their children reaching adulthood with diminishing prospects of joining in. House prices are turning 21st century Australia into something more like an old world country where inheritance trumps all else, and if you are born without, chances are that you will stay that way. The author states, this is not the Australia that all those beneficiaries of unearned wealth grew up in, and it's not the Australia that I would like to leave behind. And I totally agree. We've taken a housing market that was very affordable just 30 years ago, and we've royally screwed it, and we're handing the next generation a crap sandwich. Some will be lucky and receive a property inheritance from, say, Sydney or one of the other capital cities, but other young people will be left out in the cold because Maybe they receive a property inheritance from regional Australia, or maybe they don't receive any property inheritance at all. Now in the past, it didn't really matter so much about your inheritance because you had great opportunities to be able to 
buy property, to build wealth, and most Australians enjoyed the same sort of opportunities. But what we've done with allowing house prices to grow so much more than wages, we've now taken that opportunity away from a large section of the community. And so we've created this huge wealth gap and this huge inequity gap. And for me, that's a tragedy and it's something I'm trying to fight against. And don't get me wrong, I love property and I love property investment. I just really want all Australians to have the opportunity to be able to purchase their own property at prices that are affordable compared to wages. So that way, hardworking Australians can enjoy the Australian dream of owning their own property. Do you agree that we might have betrayed this next generation by what we've allowed the housing market to do? Or do you think it's all a load of rubbish and young people should stop complaining? Whatever your views are, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. And while you're there, why don't you click on that button that says subscribe? I would truly appreciate having you on board and love to get to know you. I'm Biko Constantinos and I'll catch you in my next video. Ooh.